you're ready, so I won't say any more now. I'll, I'll introduce Zana. Uh, thank you very much, and you're going to you're going yes. to um, say something about this piece and yeah. where it comes from. Thank Hello. You. Um, let's address the elephant in the room. It is cold in here. <laughs> um, it is very cold in here. So, like, be prepared to jiggle and wiggle a little bit, like with different types of music and um, drums. So, essentially, things are better now. Is um, a question that I pose to different people from different backgrounds, um, particularly like people that lived in like local areas like Tower Hamlets and um, in Southwark and things like this. And I really wanted to gauge their responses on the question of are things truly better now? And one of the things that I've been looking at is the idea of memory and legacy and who gets to who gets to own that legacy, who gets to talk about that legacy. Who are the strongest voices in the room when we're talking about that narrative? Um, are we really making any deeper steps to actually listening to each other? Um, or are we just hearing what we want to hear and reacting to that? So a part of Things Are Better Now is addressing uncomfortability, discomfort, when it comes to people talking about issues around race. And it's very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable talking about it. It's uncomfortable living in it. Um, and for me, one of the things that I really wanted to provoke was not just a discussion, but the ability to just simply be quiet and listen to those who are speaking out. And I feel like this year is actually the perfect year to kind of do this because it's the 70th anniversary when the Windrush came into Britain. And it's really important because for me also, my parents, um, they traveled from their home of Jamaica to Britain for the promise of a better life, um, bar the invitation, basically, an invitation to come and build up the mother country. So the, rail, the rails that I travel on today, the buildings that I'm walking in, all of these different things are built up by history. But again, where is that history in our conversations? Where is that history in our everyday interactions? Are we actually only addressing it through ideas around, like, diversity protocols and quantities and numbers? Are we actually addressing it when we're in a room full of people that look like us? Are we only addressing it when we're in a room full of people that don't look like us? How are we actually engaging in that conversation? Um, I feel like there's a lack of emotional intelligence that exists in Britain because we want to connect with each other, but we'll do everything in our power not to. So we'll put ourselves in containments and we'll travel and we'll actually literally lie on top of each other in a train, but we won't connect eyes. That's just too far. And so I feel like it's important to create this dialogue, but also not to be a site of trauma, violence, and pain always. And that's why I have the drums, because the steel pans are often seen as something that's joyful, but it can also be something that's quite traumatic, because the history around it was about people being able to have access to a sound, have an access to joy. And also what it's being used for today is about preserving life, having a refuge for life. So I remember growing up as a child, my dad shipping goods home to my grandmother in Jamaica. And for me, that is an important part of sustaining your interactions with people, whether or not they're in the same country as you or they're far away. It's preserving that connection. Um, and we don't do that enough. We don't talk about it enough. In fact, we ignore it. We deny it. It's a part of a British erasure. erasure. It's an identity that we have now worn and is now insidious. So where it was really obvious, now it's more implied. And for me, um, I can't sit with that. I like having uncomfortable things around, actually, because if it's uncomfortable, you know it's uncomfortable. Why are you sitting in it? Why aren't you addressing it? So right now, we actually have pieces of paper. And I did the fun thing that everyone loves, audience participation, <laughs> where basically, um, it is really hard to be in a room full of people you don't know. So I also want us to think about breaking down that issue, but also addressing or going in the direction of addressing some of those things. Um, so if you actually start looking at your piece of paper, and as well, in the corner, um, I don't know if you can see, there's a little tunnel thing here. I've actually opened up one of the drums and I fitted it with a speaker. So part of the idea of erasure is literally st sticking your head in the ground. And that's what British history is, 
sticking your head in the ground and presenting a convenient narrative for you. So I feel like the heaviness of race is a stain, but it requires everyone to put in the work. So that means that if you really truly want to face it, you put your face in it and you listen. Um, and you allow yourself to be consumed by it, the heaviness of it, all of it, just let it hit you in the face. So if everybody wants to just like look at their pieces of paper and it's participatory, so participatory, I can't say that word, whatever. Um, so um, everyone please just, yeah, get going. And you're also welcome to move around. So if you feel like you wanna go and have uh, like a go in the barrel, you can no, use a... Realizing actually this is not, so do come and stick your head in that barrel if you want to. Yes. Yeah. As you're reading it, answer your questions and also shout out your answers. So I was, I was. Bradwin! Chris!
two young staff there. I've been at the, the top tables, they're talking about it. I've been at the small tables, they're talking about it. This is the place that you know what they're talking about, let me know. I'm happy to attend. Um, yeah, and not sure, I'm not sure that they're comfortable, they're all fucking uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's a fashion, right now it's a fashion. So they'll, say, they'll talk about it in a small sentence, you know, as a news pressing. And I think also, You shouldn't feel uncomfortable now, you just yell to a room of people that you don't know. Okay, so um, does anyone know a person called Pauline Little? This is an amazing thing called um, deep listening. So it's like if you hum and you're listening to the person next to you, you automatically find a synchronization in each other. Um, that's what I want us to try and do is like hum. So it's just a simple. When you hear the phrase, things are better now, what is the first thought that springs, that springs to mind? The first thought that springs to mind is fast. It's I actually, it's anyone who believes that is confused, it's a goddamn lie. Anyone who believes that is entitled, anyone who believes that is probably white, white passing. Anyone who believes that is English slash British. Um, yeah, and that's what, that's what I believe. I don't know how you can believe that. Things are better now on, on, on whose context? On whose context are we referring to? It would, it would be it would be different if we were you know 100 years of age and we had lived through a war of some sort i, I can kind of understand how you come to that conclusion but the reality is things for us as people in our generation things are not better now statistically things are not better we are the most deprived we are the, the most likely to die for our parents we are the most the way going to be the older generation the older to be what working Work workforce in the country it's 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 fast. Yeah. It's just okay. Do you believe in the better life? Okay. Your parents came here to be built with what they achieved. Yes, yes, yes it is, yes it is. My the better life I uh, have uh, the better life that my mother came to achieve was freedom, and freedom for her did not include race. Freedom for her meant oppression. 
questions from gen- set gender, gender based norms, questions from uh, <laughs> PhD rules, gender based norms, questions from my father, questions from my father, questions from my mother, questions from assistants that was, that was you know, built in a colonial structure that, that talked to us about gender based norms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah
My cultural identity is South Asian. Um, my nationality is Bangladeshi, but I was born in Britain. Um, I always thought of myself as British, you know, I grew up wishing I was white, um, you know, but the way society, you know, looks at me and my family, you know, we're just brown, you know, we're just brown imitating whiteness, you know, like mum and dad, you know, my mum and baba, they were born in British India, lived through East Pakistan after the divide and rule between Hindus and Muslims, the way, you know, the British Raj pitted each community against each other, you know, that partition caused severe upheavals, trauma, pain, rioting, so many people being killed and raped, you know, just because they people wanted independence and this is the price they paid for it. Um, you know, and after that, you know, it was the oppression of the the, the, Pakistan, the Pakistani government and, that, and the creation of Bangladesh. You know, we think about South Asia, India, India's connection to Britain, sort of this long-standing kind of connection, all the sailors coming to the UK. Um, you know, all the, you know, the curry houses, you know, that populate, you know, the UK. You know, most of those, you know, it's Indian food, but, you know, most of those are housed, manned, or built um, by um, Bangladeshi immigrants, um, people who are economic migrants, um, and cooking food was, you know, the only way to survive here. And, and that's become synonymous now with a type of British culture. It's been distilled into, oh, Britain loves tikka masala, uh, chicken tikka masala. That's, that, that's British identity, and that's like my role within it, um, it, it is being part of this subtext, this footnote of, of British culture. We're just one of these things that make it great. And, and actually, you know, there's a separation of that. No, we all, British would, Britain would not have had any culture, you know, if it hadn't had spread its wings and, you know, colonized all of these countries, stolen all of this, their resources, taken labor, forcibly displaced people, um, you know, and it's just distilled into, yay, we have all this fun food that's for us to eat, great. No, you know, I am a British citizen, um, you know, for what is British culture, you know, do I have my own culture, you know, what does it mean to live through that?
say thank you so much to Ramon Lee for playing with me. Um, it's, it's been great, it's been great driving with you. We were trying to get our serious faces on when we distracted us that we got to have a serious face. This is very intense. Um, and I wanted to say thank you so much to Tracy at the back for um, just the guidance and reassurance and Rachel as well. Um, and to all of the Spitterfuls team and also to my mentor Hannah Kathleen Jones for telling me there are no wrong notes, you just have to play the notes of conviction. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking part. Um, I know it's difficult, I know it's uncomfortable, um, so just try to imagine people doing this every day, and then it will feel a bit easier.